Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Graduate from Shaker to Fermenter. I am Judy O'Rourke of Blabberts, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labroots and sponsored by Eppendorf. Eppendorf is a leading life science company that develops and sells instruments, consumables, and services for liquid sample and cell handling performed in laboratories around the globe. For more information, please visit eppendorf.com. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button at lower left. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Michele Dorseus, Bioprocess Application Specialist at Eppendorf North America. Michele Dorseus has a bachelor's degree in biology and chemistry from Salem State University. He has been working in process development and manufacturing in the biotechnology and biopharmaceutical industry for over 12 years. He has worked for Abbott, Wyeth, Massachusetts Biologic Laboratory, Shire Pharmaceutical, and now with Eppendorf North America. I will now turn it over to our speaker for his presentation. Thank you, Judy. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for participating in today's webinar. My name is Michelle Dorsey, and I'll be your speaker for today. In today's webinar, we're going to discuss uh, graduate from Shaker to fermenter a slash bioreactor. Uh, today's webinar uh, will focus primarily on several parts. First, we're going to touch a traditional method of cell culture. Um, second, we're going to discuss briefly the benefit of bioreactors uh, um, slash fermenter and looking at a small scale and single use bioreactor solution that's available and, and also looking at um, some future of bioreactor um, such as bioreactor design and we're going to look at uh, the mode of operations and bioreactors and various technology for uh, suspension and also um, encourage cell, uh, cell dependent. Uh, cell-dependent uh, uh, system technologies available out there. Now, in, in this webinar, um, it will be mostly beneficial to the scientists and engineers who are currently right now culturing or uh, fermenting um, using a uh, uh, spanners flask and also a shake flask and an incubator. Um, so without further ado, we're going to start. Um, traditional, uh, traditional scale-up method for suspension cell in adherent cell culture um, is showing on this slide here. As you can see, on to the left, you have a frozen vial, which um, one can obtain from a working cell bank or a master cell bank. Then they will take that vial and thaw it out into a, uh, a single flask. And as the cell density uh, increase or grow, and they will then aliquot it and further Spring, um, split the cells into uh, multiple uh, flasks and basically after this the cell density increase from that from those shake flasks then they would basically transfer it into the technology platform they are using um, so as you can see on the right if they are using the phone attachment cells they can transfer it to a large shake flask a large dish uh, a water bottle a cells um, cell stock uh, chambers, um, hyperstack vessels, uh, or E-cube system. Or if they are using a suspension adapted cells and they can use a spinner flask or a shake flask. Uh, for today's webinar, we'll mostly discuss the uh, suspension method for adapted cell, cell culture. Okay. Uh, traditionally, uh, 
This slide is showing uh, the growth mechanism that been used in growing the cell, as we discussed in the previous slide. So to the top left, you see your uh, T flask, which is used for the uh, adherent cell line. Um, along on the top right, you see the picture just of your multi-well plate, which also used for the attachment cell line. And um, on the middle, you have your spinner flask and your shake flask on the bottom left of the slide. Now, for our discussion, as mentioned, we're going to be focused primarily on those two platform technologies. Now, spinner flask, this is showing uh, spinner flask, which have a range from 125 mil up to 36 liters, um, up, to, up to 36 liter. As you can see, they can accommodate anywhere from, from one times 10 to the eighth uh, cells total, all the way up to three times 10 to the 10th cell, with a working volume range anywhere from 100 to uh, 36 liter. Now, um, as, as, as you can see, there are some limiting factor on that because as you uh, find your target molecule you are trying to produce, uh, the maximum you can actually produce is 36 liter. So that, that right there create a bottleneck so we'll be exploring further and to, uh, throughout our presentation. Next one is what we're looking at is some advantage and disadvantage. Um, if you look um, on the advantage section, you look at these, um, uh, they are very economical and compact to use the uh, uh, spinners. They are simple to harvest, so you pretty much just uh, remove the spinner, bring it into your BSC, and you pour out the content of your uh, cell culture and uh, 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 microbial fermentation that you are growing. Um, it is uh, less limber intensive than flask and, and water bottle. Some of the uh, disadvantage is uh, it's difficult to feed the culture because you can't feed it in an open air due to contamination, so you have to remove it from the um, from the incubator and bring it into biological safety cabinet and all try to basically maneuver it around, uh, lean it over and try to feed it that way. So that make it a bit challenging at time to feed. And also it require a magnetic stir. Um, so which means that you need a stir to be inside the incubator. So you need an, a stir that is, um, can stay a long time in the uh, CO2 incubator without um, going bad. And also it's required the incubator as the uh, mechanism to provide temperature control, gas uh, delivery, and also pH control as well. And it's also required lots of uh, labor to decontaminate, clean, and reassemble and sterile as well. So next we have your uh, typical shake flask. Um, so the shake flask is um, it is more common in, in today in cell expansion um, and also uh, media study. So the shake flask come both in glass and also in single use. Um, you have shake flasks that have uh, that come with buffer for better mixing. You have um, also they come either vented with a vented cap and non-vented as well for different uh, various applications. As you can see on the uh, slide, they range from 50 mil to 6 liter and can accommodate cell density ranging anywhere from 2 times 10 to the 7 cells all the way up to 2 times 10 to the 9th. So, and also with a working volume from 15 mil all the way to 2.4. Again, as you can see, we have a working volume limitation here. So if you wanted to go beyond that, unfortunately, you would have to either have more shape flasks, which then would occupy, um, you would need more incubators and more personnel to, to, you, uh, to run it. And also you would need uh, more space as well. Um, next, we're gonna touch base on some of the advantage and disadvantage of shape flasks as well. Um, it, they are very economical and compact as well. Uh, it's simple to harvest, um, and they, some include um, baffle for gas exchange, and it's easy to scale up from your 50 mil all the way up to your 6 liter because they're geometrically they're very similar. 
uh, some of this disadvantage uh, they only use for suspension cell culture uh, unless you use like uh, technology such as microcarrier inside of them to uh, grow attachment cell they only use uh, for suspension cell and as the same as um, the spin bottle they also require incubators um, and also the uh, shake flask require uh, a shaking apparatus that would allow it to mix and uh, transfer oxygen and also gas to control the pH as well. Next what we're looking at is a humidified CO2 incubator and shaker. Humidify CO2 incubator is used to for the both the spinner flask and also the shaker as well. Um, it's humidified because it's help with um, volume loss in the culture. Without, as we know, if we in in, uh, in in cell culture, if you don't humidify, you would have some volume loss in your shake flask and your culture, which would uh, in return um, increase the concentration of your media, and that may not be good for the cell health overall. Um, as, as you can see here on the slide, on the uh, top left, there are three parameters um, on some of the shakers. You have temperature and you have your CO2 and air combination and also some have um, the agitation as well, speed recorded. Now in the middle of that, you'll, you'll have an incubate, CO2 incubator that's come embedded with, uh, with a, sh a shaker on it. That way you don't have a second mechanism that can go bad in the shaker because the incubator already come with the, shaker flex, with the shaking platform. So all you really do really is insert your shake flask. Now for the uh, spinners, however, you need to have a stirrer. So um, in, some, in the middle, of incubator you would have to remove that shaking platform and insert a stirrer so that way you can run your process that is in the spinner flask. Now in, in terms of, of scale up or to generate larger volume as you can see in the middle as well you pretty much would just use a lot more uh, shake flask and or spinner to spin because you have a uh, size limitation so you can't go past um, six liter for the uh, shakers and 36 liter for the um, spanners as well. Now, next we're going to take a look at some uh, process parameter for the shaker and spanner flask. So, uh, temperature, as we discussed, is primarily controlled by the incubator. The uh, incubator uh, typically maintain anywhere from from 37 for your cell for your cell growth, um, and also anywhere from 31 as well. Um, gas transfer is predominantly done to the vented cap and that is um, also done um, inside the uh, incubator. Usually there is a mixing of, a, of air and uh, CO2 whereas um, it's used as the uh, uh, oxygen supply and uh, the CO2 to uh, control the uh, uh, pH. So, um, pH is not controlled or, or monitored. It's um, so therefore a lot of the time you have to buffer your media very well in order to maintain um, your pH at a desired set point, and you put the pH pretty much will do a drift over time. Agitation is done in the shake flask by the shaking platform, and you, uh, the scientist or engineer, decided um, what is your desired um, RPM going to be. Um, feed is done manually, um, pri primarily in a uh, biological safety cabinet to prevent contamination. And um, the DO is not controlled or monitored. And uh, CO2 as well is not controlled or monitored. And scale up, as I said, can be a challenge due to uh, size limitation. So because of all these um, bottleneck and uh, limitation, what we have um, to address some of these concern is the rise of a bioreactor. So in next slide, we are going to cover some of the benefit of uh, bioreactor and of, uh, slash fermenters where 
we address some of the bottlenecks um, issues we have with shaking uh, platform as well as the spanner as well. Now, with, uh, the benefit of a bioreactor, and as you can see, on the right here is a sample of a small scale bioreactor um, in which come is a stir tank reactor, um, which able to accommodate a suspension cell as well as a here and dependent cell. Um, it's automa automatically controlled for your pH, your DO, uh, CO2, and also temperature as well. Unlike um, your standard um, shake flask uh, and a CO2 incubator, or, and, and also the spinner as well, where you don't have any control at all. Um, you're pretty much uh, relying on, the, on your buffer and your media to help maintain your uh, pH uh, control. And for your temperature, you rely primarily on the uh, uh, incu uh, incubator to uh, supply with the right temperature. Well, with the uh, with the bioreactor, that's get taken care of for you automatically because it is a more specialized equipment that is designed to help you maintain and control and monitoring um, your process parameter set point. Next, you have the process flexibility. One great thing about bioreactors is it provides you with the option to basically run all type of processes, uh, such as uh, your batch, uh, your fed batch, and also as well as perfusion. We will explore these processes later on in our uh, discussion. Next, you have scalable. Um, so the bioreactor make it very easy to scale up, which help address the bottlenecks we have with uh, shake flasks and spanners with the limitation from 36 liters for the spanners and also to uh, six liters in the uh, shake flask. So with, with bioreactor, really, uh, you can scale up to uh, large anywhere from, from 50 mil to all the way up to uh, 500,000 liters um, in a starting bioreactor. It's uh, very robust. And it's, the agitation is also used in uh, fermentation as a source of help um, delivering um, oxygen as well uh, to help maintain oxygen set point. And you also have um, aeration, which is done to a centered steel sparge or can also be done to a macro sparge to basically help maintain your desired deal set point. Next, we're going to look at uh, some small scale and, and single use bioreactor that's currently available in the, in the industry, which primarily used for um, media optimization, uh, clone, uh, clone and cell line screening, uh, strain characterization, uh, and process development as well. Now, you have the small scale bioreactor is, been, is currently been using right now in biopharmaceutical, the biochemical field, and uh, nutrition as well, um, using across all the processes uh, such as research and development, your uh, process development, and also pilot and manufacturing as well. Now, what is uh, start to, uh, to gain ground in our industry is that instead of using various uh, shake flats uh, to scale up, a lot of scientists now is using uh, small scale bioreactors to basically um, doing cell line optimization, their media screening, so that way they can go directly from uh, the small scale bioreactor into the large scale production bioreactor once they have um, discovered the ideal molecule. So that tend to be um, an ongoing uh, platform in and throughout the industry. Next, uh, you have uh, is here is really it's looking at the uh, mini bioreactor system, showing the option that um, it comes in instead of four, instead of eight, twelve, or more that so you can have. And one one great thing about it is that it gives you the flexibility with the working volume range from anywhere from sixty to two hundred and fifty mil. Um, what's great about that is we all know media is very costly, so it's defined to 
to find the bioreactor that you can run at, at uh, 60 mil is very, it's not only cost saving, but also that it mimics your process at the large scale. So it, so once you basically establish a process in this uh, small starting bioreactor, um, as long as your bioreactor is ge geometrically similar, then you should be able to just scale up to your large uh, pilot or uh, process development or your production scale vessel as well. Now, what's great about uh, this this uh, system is that it comes with both glass for your autoclavable um, glass autoclavable and also single use technology. So the single use technology really is is great because that's allow you to still have the same flexibility you have with with your shake glass. You pretty much do experiment and then at the end of your uh, run, you can you have the option to just toss. Um, does that have the single use. Oh, but also give you the flexibility if you want to use glass vessel at the end of your culture, you just pretty much um, wash and re auto and reuse uh, your uh, uh, glass bioreactor. Now, as, as discussed, this uh, system really, because of its compacts and flexibility, and also is um, a small range of volume, it's make it ideal for design of experiment and scale down approach. So we have a lot of uh, uh, customers right now are using it really for design of experiment and uh, scale down approach. Next, we, we're looking at some of the uh, industry's uh, standard process uh, control capabilities of the system. As you can see here below on the slide, you have your control parameters. Um, such as your uh, pH, your DO, and temperature and agitation, as we discussed. And the system is able to control that for you, uh, your set point, automatically for you without really have to worry much. Um, also, you have your liquid feed. The system also uh, controls your feed for you, um, and including any corrective agent that you may have, such as base, um, acid controls, um, and also control your gas delivery. Uh, any levels of redox probe you may have, and so also come with an option of gas analysis as well. So, um, because of this kind of, of this, all of those features and option and also flexibility, it really is the optimal design tools for uh, DOE design of experiment. Next, we have here really, if you can see uh, in this uh, slide, we're showing how compact the system is. So you have in a six foot um, space, we're able to fit in about 24 vessel. As you can see here, you also have the option really to, for, for those uh, customers who in the lab are working with um, dual process, such as fermentation as well as cell culture, you can split the, the system. If you can see the first 12 on the left is a fermentation culture, and on the right is for um, 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 cell culture. So the system is very compact and which make it um, ideal for uh, screening characterization of the optimization as well without occupying too much bench space. Okay. Next what we have is the uh, mini bioreactor itself um, showing how compact it is. Um, and it's, uh, so you have your glass body with a stainless steel um, head plate um, it's easy to handle and, and screw the caps on. Um, as we discussed earlier, come with a working volume of 60 to 100 uh, to 250 mils. You have a ratio of uh, from two to one. Um, the total volume is 350. Um, it is come with an overhead drive using the miniature lip seal assembly. You have the option for Rashton impeller for your um, fermentation culture, uh, coming there with a marine or a pitch blade for your cell culture apparatus. It's also come uh, integrated with an exhaust condenser as well. So the great thing about this exhaust condenser, it is liquid free, so you don't have to worry about liquid accumulation, which may trap um, uh, bacteria and may cause uh, uh, contamination. It's also come equipped with utilize of off the shelf um, pH and DO sensor um, from um, all the sensor. You can pretty much use any sensor uh, provider with the system as well. So it is a true um, bioreactor that you can use to, uh, to develop your process. 
Next, what we're showing here is the single-use vessel. Um, we have uh, to the left is the uh, microbial uh, single-use vessel, and the middle is uh, our cell culture single-use vessel. And all to the right is our pack bed system, which can be used for the adherent or the attached cell as well as suspension as well. Next, what we uh, have really is the uh, um, single-use family uh, scalability issue. So if you want to use the single-use in your early um, bench style process development, um, it uh, will make it easier for you to just really scale up to the pilot size all the way up to uh, 50 liter with a working volume up to 40. As you can see, there is various range of um, um, agitations. Um, it range anywhere from 20 in the uh, 0.3 C bioreactor all the way up to uh, 150 RPM for our 50, for our um, single use 50 liter, and with various working volume as well. Next, what we have here is uh, temperature and agitation control. Um, the system we um, come with an independent, as we discussed, is a liquid-free heating and, and cooling. Um, come with the heating and cooling for your fermentation uh, controls, and also the, the heating for your uh, cell culture um, uh, processes. Uh, can control from temperature range anywhere from 10 to 60 degrees Celsius. Okay. Uh, as far as agitation, we have the system come with a brushless overhead drive. You have agitation range from anywhere from 20 RPM all the way up to 25 RPM. As you can see here to the right, um, right next to the bioreactor, there is uh, various type of impellers. So you have your Rushton type impeller as well as your uh, pitch blade along with the marine to accommodate different processes such as cell culture and fermentation as well. Next, we have the integrated gas mixing system, which is used basically to maintain your uh, DO set point or your CO2 stripping. Um, we have uh, come with continuous mixing of air, uh, nitrogen, oxygen, and also CO2. You have its fully mass flow control. You have a total of 16 mass flow controller per full, uh, per full, full unit. You have gas range for from um, five standard liter per, uh, per hour and to a max of uh, 25 standard liter per hour. And you have the option to either have um, a submerged sparger or an overlay gas can also be configured to the system. Next, what we have is a feeding and monitoring system. As you can see here on the top right, that is the, the pumps that the system used to feed the culture that you have grown, whether it's, your, it's fermentation or, bio or uh, cell culture. So you have, um, so, so you have miniature peristaltic pump using variable speed drive. We have a, uh, a continuous feed rate anywhere ranging from 0.3 to 420 uh, mil per hour. Um, each system comes with a standard of two feed optional, but you can add up to four feed per bioreactor if you like. And also, as you can see on the bottom, is the graph. So as you and not only have the, con have the capability to control, but you also have the capability to, to see the process train, to detect any outlier, any issue that may happen, any spike that may occur in your uh, media, in your uh, culture as you grow. So the system also uh, able to monitor that and trend it for you, and you can actually see for yourself live of what's going on inside of your culture as well. Next, what we have here really is a, uh, an example that we actually did in-house using the eight-fold system 
that is show uh, using E. coli. We were using uh, E. coli design an experiment with various concentration of glucose. And as you can see on the uh, graph that the system was able to train and maintain um, and control at the same time our alt eight system, um, uh, alt eight system process parameter um, right on the graph for us. And we were able to visually see what has occurred throughout the run and uh, was able to uh, see all the data at the end of our uh, culture. Next, we are going to move to uh, bioreactor design. We're going to take a look at and see how the bioreactor design and what's involved, various parts. So typical, a, a basic bioreactor component, really, you have a you motor and impeller that very much um, supply you mixing uh, and also use and fermentation as your early phase of gas supply as well. So the mixing allow, allow you to reach homogeneity, mixed, uh, to have um, efficient mixing all throughout the culture. You have, uh, and next to that in the bottom um, left is you have your sparge element, which what supply gas to your culture. Uh, you have as well next up is the the sparge line, which is the line that have a, a filter attached to it, which filter in your um, gas supply that can, which can be your air, uh, CO2, and oxygen as well. And you have um, your heat and cooling that that um, used to control your temperature set point. You have your a, uh, a computer that's control all of your set point and your processes um, you have set up. Next, we're going to basically touch on um, uh, basically looking at uh, a fermenters. What's the difference between a fermenters versus a bioreactor? So to the to the left, as you can see, that is a fermentation uh, vessel. Um, and to the right, you have is a, uh, a bioreactor, which is primarily for cell culture. Okay. So the main difference between a fermenters and a bioreactor, really, one is the impellers. So for fermentation, um, as we previously discussed, we use the Russian impeller. We use the Russian impeller because it's um, the, for the microbial of bacteria, they are more susceptible to shear, so they are able to main, to basically deal with a much higher agitation than cell culture. And you have second also is your speed of your agitation and the motor power. So in the, in the fermenters, you have the, your motor usually have a much um, higher um, output than your standard um, cell culture um, agitator because um, you spend, your mixing in your fer in fermentation is much greatly than, it's uh, higher, I should say, than um, those in, um, in cell culture. And also the rate of sparging of air or gas. So you have the rate of sparging um, air or in various gases into fermentation is much higher than you would have in um, cell culture. And also the operating temperature range. Uh, so the temperature in fermentation, then you, that's why you have both cool and also heat. Because in fermentation, as, um, as you, as your OD increases, the culture tend to generate heat. So you need a way to cool down on the uh, the culture to maintain you know, the desired set point. So which is why they use the cool. Whereas in cell culture, it's very rare that you really have to cool down your culture uh, to maintain set point. It's mostly you just need to maintain that to by using heat. And you have your vessel ship. Um, which we're going to be covered next. So in fermentation, um, in, in bioreactor ship, they uh, are a bit uh, different. So as, as you can see here on the right, you have the uh, fermenter is have a terraspherical ship, whereas for your bioreactor, they have uh, yeah, 
a hemispherical bottom shape. And for uh, cell culture, typical uh, shape is usually a three to one in, in diameter to height ratio, whereas for a uh, uh, fermenter, it's usually a two to one. It's more elongated than a uh, bioreactor. Next, what we're looking at is temperature controlled. Um, as you can see um, on the uh, uh, picture to the left is the bioreactor that have a heat, um, heat plate. Um, so you have the heat being distributed from the bottom and, the, uh, and circulate all the way up to the culture by picking up, the impellers picking up the, the, uh, the well mix and distribute it up to the top of the culture, where you have in the bottom, which is a bioreactor, where which use a temperature control to a jacketed vessel, um, using um, water as the um, um, heat distributor. And you have to the right is, uh, is your single-use vessel, which use an electric uh, heating blanket to provide uh, temperature control. Next, um, what we have is the agitation, as we've been discussed. So you have on the top right is your Rushton type impeller. Um, so you have, which predominantly use in your fermentation uh, culture. And in the bottom, you have your um, pitch blade, which use in um, cell culture application. Um, you can have the drive come um, with various drives. You can have magnetic drive as well as direct drive. Um, you, you can have um, double mechanical seals as well. Next, what we're looking uh, at is uh, the impeller ship, which used for oxygen transfer. Rate. Now, the Russian type impeller is more efficient in delivering um, oxygen because of, because fermentation, as we know, have a much higher demand for oxygen. So therefore, you need an impeller that can accommodate that, that can actually supply the oxygen to maintain your set point. So for that, we use um, scientists in the field use the Russian type impeller to uh, supply oxygen, but also to maintain homogeneity throughout the culture. And you have in the middle is your pitch blade which is second in supplying um, high OTR, which primarily used in cell culture. Um, and you have to the right, uh, marine blade impeller, which used um, in you more like shear sensitive cell culture. Uh, so if you have a cell line that is susceptible to, uh, to shear, you would use a marine impeller to help uh, that. Next, what we're looking at is uh, agitation and, uh, and a fermentation. So you have, in fermentation, as, as we have discussed, we have a, uh, an agitation that, uh, an agitator that is using the Rushton type blade. So for common for fermentation application, it, the agitation typically perform at a higher RPM to maximize oxygen transfer rate and also provide um, higher stability and less concern for, for shear to the cells. So it, so the Rushton like impeller are typically used for that. And you have um, the impeller blade typically possess a paddle design as showing here to the right of the screen. Next, what we're looking at is the cell culture impeller um, to so you have to the left, uh, from left to right, is you have your spin filter with the impeller for suspension cells or uh, your microcarrier um, cells and in perfusion. And you have, uh, follow that, is your cell lift impeller for low shear and high oxygenated and microcarrier culture. And you have, following that, is the pattern for low shear basket impeller. Um, without the basket's not showing here, but later well. And you have next is your pitch blade impeller for high aeration with, uh, for low shear for mammalian cell culture. And then you have your uh, 
marine blade impeller for the growth of insects and other cultures. Next, you have buffer. Buffer is is pre, is, um, is used to help uh, breaking the culture to basically uh, be supply um, gas more efficiently and help to maintain a more homogeneity within the culture. Um, Buffers are usually located alongside of the vessel um, to help breaking uh, any vortex and to help maintain homogeneity all throughout the culture. Now we uh, next is the uh, fermenters and barrier for differences um, when he, when it comes down to the uh, impeller spacing and uh, the buffer size. So with two impeller, um, we will have you have usually it's uh, a the L1 where it's equal to one impeller in diameter. So if you look here to the to the right and the bottom where L1. Um, so your impeller is located about one, di one diameter of the impeller that you are using in that bioreactor. Where if you need to, with three impeller, um, your spacing it is 1.5 impeller in, uh, in diameter apart from each other, from the shaft. And the buffer are equally spacing on either side of the vessel wall. Next, you have your typical uh, um, bioprocess parameter for, uh, for biological such as temperature and pH and DO. And you have your mechanical um, such as aeration and forming and pressure. And you have also, uh, as we uh, discussed, is uh, your temperature control, um, which done by um, cooling um, can be uh, via water jacketed versa, uh, can use a chiller to, as your as your cooling device, where it circulate uh, ethylene or guaiacol, you know, uh, an antifreeze product to provide freeze for protection and rusting inhibiting within the uh, cooling device. And you have your heat with supply using your water jacketed, and also uh, can be used electricity yeah, through heating blanket and steam you for use. Um, steam in place uh, bioreactors. Next, this is uh, really showing a, a control loop of, uh, it's an example of control loop of how the system maintained and controlled uh, your, a, a desired set point. Here we're showing that uh, for using temperature, you have your RTD embedded inside the uh, bioreactor, which um, determine or get a reading and then send it to the uh, controller, then the, then the controller then compare that reading to your uh, process set point and then determine whether to activate the, the heat or the, the cooling in order to maintain that, set, that desired set point the scientist or the end user has established. Next, you have your uh, is your P is your tr um, traditional pH uh, control uh, pH probe. Um, you have a, a typical pH probe uh, which used to measure your electrochemical um, potential between the non-liquid inside the glass uh, uh, electrode and an unknown liquid outside. Um, you have um, right now you can get both um, evasive and non-evasive pH. And as we all know, the, the pH probe pretty much is uh, fluorescent, and it's detect of hydrogen ion um, and convert that hydrogen ion concentration to give you a pH rating. Next, you have your DO control, um, and as, as well, um, now you can get um, either evasive, meaning that it's uh, touching your culture, or non-invasive, meaning that it's not touching your culture, like your bioreactor. And, um, you can get your, your, your photographic probe um, is an external voltage is needed um, to, to use that with supply by the bioreactor controller. And uh, as you can see in, in, in the bottom, is showing you uh, the anode and the electrode so, uh, solution that's need to end that need in order for the uh, probe to be able to give you a accurate and operating um, correct code.
Next, we have a DO uh, control uh, strategy for fermentation. So agitation alone will increase DO. So for, for starting um, in, in most fermentation, you have um, uh, usually the, the goal is to ramp up the agitation to maintain the DO. Now, as your OD increases and you're struggling to maintain DO, then you basically add uh, start sparging air to maintain, uh, to maintain that set point where when air basically reach its maximum output and unable to maintain the DO set point, then you would supplement that by sparging in uh, oxygen as well to maintain that set point. And this method is primarily used for uh, uh, fermentation. Next we have is a, uh, the DO control strategy for cell culture. So agitation often uh, stay constant uh, on, in cell culture um, and may vary slightly depending on the processes. Um, mostly controlled by the, uh, the DO is mostly controlled by sparging um, either air or oxygen um, to the uh, culture. And you can either use a macro, micro sparging or a uh, macro. Uh, micro is more efficient in uh, um, oxygen delivery, however, it may cause some damage, some shear damage to cell line that is shear sensitive. Next, what we're going to total discuss is different um, apparatus that used to deliver gas um, into the culture. So you have, here you have to the left is your single earth, which is pretty much used as a single hole that used uh, to, to deliver uh, gas to the culture. Or you can have the, and you in the center here, a rain sparger uh, to, to deliver gas and the rain spargers is primarily used for your more shear sensitive cell line and uh, to deliver a bigger bubble to help um, with, uh, with the shearing. And also you have your centered steel sparge, which I use primarily for your more robust, a robust cell line that is not as uh, shear sensitive um, as, as cell culture, primarily on your uh, fermentation um, processes. Next year, what you have here really is your uh, typical filters that you use in the bioreactor as the uh, stair, as the uh, gas filter, which filter your gas uh, to allow the gas to enter your vessel uh, sterilely in order to prevent contamination. Next, what we're looking at is different me uh, mechanism that control the gas delivery. So you have. On, on the top right is your uh, standard um, um, analog um, rotometer that supply um, gas. Um, and you have on the bottom right is a TMFC, which is a thermal mass flow controller, which is more accurate and uh, measured temperature changes across heated element, which, which is then transferred into mass of air or gas. Um, it's not sensitive to temperature or pressure, so it's electronic control automatically by the controller system. Next, we have um, a foam control um, apparatus. So this um, agitation device, because uh, for some application, you will get foam in your culture. So this um, agitation device help maintain with foam. So on the, on the right, uh, if you look on the right, on the top here, you have um, here, um, right mid to in the uh, agitation device, so you would have some foam, um, um, some anti foam being housing there, and as the foam reach uh, into the anti foam, and the foam would be dissolved and dissipated um, throughout the culture. Next, we're going to move to mode of operation. Um, so there are typically uh, three modes, as we discussed earlier, there is batch and fed batch, um, and also uh, perfusion. So where batch is the process where you have your initial medium is transferred into the vessel, and then you inoculate with a culture. Um, all of your critical parameters, temperature, agitation, and pH in DO are monitored during the processing, and the initial carbon source um, becomes depleted. Um, by the culture consumption and product is recovery and then you harvest. So you don't uh, 
feed, there is no feed or no other thing. You just pretty much inoculate, and at the end of your culture, uh, as the viability decreases, then you harvest. So here is, is uh, it's a slide that's showing the exact um, that what happens. So you have it on the top left of the of the graph in, in red. So you have um, that's pretty much your media and your subtrait. And on in blue in the middle of the graph is your cell, and in yellow is your product. So you have your uh, as your cell density increase in blue, it consumes the subtrait, the substrate, and drive it down until it's depleted and then you have used cell number um, then this crash because there is no more carbon source for them to consume. Next what we have is a fed batch. So a fed batch is when you pretty much you, you inoculate your uh, you charge your, your bioreactor and your fermenter with media, you ina you inoculate your culture and you do you can do intim an intermittent feed where you uh, determine the, the depleting um, at what day that the, the culture is depleting all of the carbon source and you basically replenish that um, that source and as um, as you're replenishing it you the you cell culture then will, will continue and, and prolong however you're going to run out of um, working volume in the barrier there at, at some point and also the uh, the waste accumulation as well going to uh, become a factor where you as well has to uh, harvest um, your culture as well. So this graph here is showing you a, a typical profile of how that uh, uh, occur. So you have here on on the on the top left, you have you start with your with a substrate, and then you would feed and you would maintain um, that substrate, and your cell density would could continue and increase and you would get a, a higher yield and, and productivity due to the higher number of cells. Now, as, as your uh, cell density increase and the byproduct, uh, such as the waste increase, um, then you, uh, the, the viability decrease, then you pretty much would harvest um, your culture. Next is what you have is your uh, continuous or, or, or profusion process, where you are simultaneously doing a feed as you are also removing your um, supernatant uh, 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 or your product, for that matter, uh, simultaneously without uh, removing the cell, where you basically find a way to retain the cells in the bioreactor using various mechanisms. So uh, there's various mechanisms which we're going to be discussing a bit. And that profile looks uh, uh, like that, as you can see. So you have your sub your initial substrate and um, as you reach that phase when you start profusion you basically start also uh, uh, sort of uh, supply and also harvest at the same time so you have a constant rate of, of product being produced as your cell density then continuously increase and this um, type of uh, culture tend to last a lot longer than uh, your batch and your fed batch because you're able to maintain um, a, a constant feed and also as you're feeding you are also removing the waste and the product as well which is which allow the cell to have a better environment for growth. Next what we're going to look at is some uh, technology which is used for suspension cell culture. Um, so here in this graph really we are basically comparing the different mode of operation and looking at the uh, number of cells you can accomplish. So here on the top, as you can see, um, we have cell density, growth mode, and cell retention device. And also we have any productivity. So as you can see here uh, in batch processes, we are able to, uh, you can basically achieve anywhere from one to five million cells per mill, where you have a uh, relative low productivity. And as compared to a fed batch, you were able to get um, from two to 25 million cells per mill and with, uh, a, with a bit more productivity as compared to a batch. And you have for profusion, you, there is various uh, technology that you can use such as hollow fiber, um, ATF, and, and spin filter along with, with uh, centrifuges available in the industry um, 
So you, you can achieve anywhere from five to 200 million cells per mil using this various technology. And as you can see, of course, with the technology such as the ATF where you can increase such high cell density, your productivity also, of course, increase over time. Um, so we take a look at just the, uh, the functionality of, of the ATF system. Really it's, an, it's a technology that's operating by um, uh, alternating tensile flow, uh, creating uh, by the action of the diaphragms and the bottom here, as you can see, that's moving uh, upward and then downward in order to um, uh, from, so it's moving the culture from the bioreactor and, and out. And at the same time, you have you have a, uh, a pump that's attached to the um, uh, membrane uh, that's having uh, where the cells cannot penetrate that membrane barrier, and which where you're collecting the product on top as well and harvest out. Next, you have is the next um, cell retention device. Um, this cell retention device is. Uh, internal of the bioreactor and that is your spend filter. Um, this the spend filter come in uh, various uh, pore size range anywhere from 12 to 14 micron. Um, so you have your cell cannot penetrate the uh, membrane of the uh, spend filter where you have a dip tube inside the, uh, uh, the spend filter where you're able to collect, um, where you're able to, to collect your uh, your conditioned media and all your molecule being being produced um, using a pump. At the same time, you are feeding in fresh nutrient here on the left hand side, as you can see. So as you're feeding, you are also removing at the same rate. Okay. Next, what we uh, have is the technology that you use uh, for perfusion and for your anchor dependent cell line. So you have um, uh, technology such as microcarrier. Microcarrier, um, really, you can get microcarrier from, from different different vendors that are available out there. They come collagen coated and non collagen coated. Um, they uh, carry a charge well, to facilitate the uh, cell attachment. They have a specific uh, density. Um, they also come with a, uh, a diameter of uh, beads ranging anywhere from 125 to 250 micrometer. Now, this is a, a picture of actually what a microcarrier looks like with cells uh, actually attached to it in the bioreactor. So as you, as you adherence cell then um, grow and attach to the microcarrier, then you have a, a, a microcarrier retention device per se in that matter, that then you, uh, as you're feeding and you're also removing your uh, conditioned media um, as well as previously uh, showed. Um, so next is really is, is comparing the, uh, uh, the microcarrier um, uh, densities that you get. So for your typical batch, uh, for uh, in microcarrier, you you get about anywhere from one to three million cells per mil, and for your uh, fed batch, you can get anywhere from six to ten million cells per mil, and you all for your perfusion um, using spin filter, you can get anywhere from fifteen to fifty million cells per mil, which give you the most productivity here on the right. Next, what you have is the pack bed uh, technology, um, which is a patent technology to uh, Eppendorf. So it's able to accommodate both suspension and anchor dependent cells. Um, it's uh, uh, stable. Um, so uh, you first then you uh, inoculate, you allow your cells to grow. And uh, uh, you have some, some company that use, uh, use to also do uh, uh, in the vaccines industry, where do they do viral in infections? Um, also, as you uh, as your cell density increase, then you basically start perfusion. What's great about this this technology is you don't have to worry about a cell retention device. You pretty much, as you're feeding, uh, you're also moving at the same rate. And it's sort of this um, uh, next slide here is illustrating of what exactly 
um, how the apparatus actually functions. As you can see on, on the left, you have your uh, fresh medium um, being pumping into the culture. At the same time, you have another pump here on the right is being collecting your uh, conditioned media and your uh, or your uh, product for that matter. Why you don't need any cell retention device because your cells are already growing in the embedded pack bed. Next, what this slide is showing really is in, in comparison to water bottle using that pack bed system on um, how much you can actually have space and water bottle you can save. So for example, uh, for a total volume of 150 liter um, in, a, in a pack bed, uh, using a pad, pack bed of, uh, uh, of, of 60 liter, you, that is the equivalent of uh, using uh, 8,471 water bottle. So for the same processes in the water bottle, you would only need to use it like a 60 liter bioreactor. The next what we have really is, is this slide is showing um, really how you can develop your um, processes using the uh, uh, small scale bioreactors we discussed earlier. And as you basically develop your process and you uh, establishing your, your processes, then you can transfer that process into a, a process development benchtop bioreactor. And that matter that's showing here, this small uh, parallel storage tank bioreactor. Um, we have in-house, and as you optimize your processes using the parallel bioreactor, then you can then transfer that into your uh, process development, 10-liter uh, um, uh, or 60-liter vessel for that matter, and you then you can then uh, scale that up to your production um, bioreactor, um, and, and uh, pretty much can use that platform as uh, your scale-up and also scale-down method as well. So in summary, really choosing an operations mode that is appropriate for the target organism, such as bacteria and suspension cells and adherent cells. Um, there is a wide range variety of bioreactor fermenter system to choose from. So it's important to select one that appropriate for the type of, um, of your process. All right, I thank everybody in the audience for participating for the time. I will take now any question that they may have. Thank you for that informative presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. And our first question is, stirring for the BioBlue needs to be charged, right? Is there a battery? No, this no the stir for the uh, bio blue does not need to be charged. It is a magnetic stir that actually controls you um, via the, the controller. Um, there is no battery needed. There is no charge uh, associated with that. Okay, I'd love to, like to give people a moment to submit some questions. Give me another moment. Okay, um, if there are no more questions, I would once again like to thank our speaker for his presentation. Do you have any final comments, Michelet? No, I just would like to, uh, no, I would like just would like to thank everybody for their uh, time and, and for participating in today's webinar. And if there is any more questions, uh, uh, 
feel free to follow up with us here at Eppendorf, um, and we can help answer any of your bioreactor, any uh, of your processes question. Please feel free to uh, contact us, and uh, we'll be able to uh, provide you with an answer and any support and solution you may need. Thank you very much, uh, Judy, for being narrated today, and Howard for putting this together, and uh, for all those who participate, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I would also like to thank our sponsor, Eppendorf, for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through six months from the live date. You'll receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. See you next time. Goodbye.